Um, I want to go back to ISIL. And I just want to ask a pretty simple question. What, what does defeat look like? What, what does destroy mean, specifically? Destroy means <laughs> eliminate their presence on the field of battle and their ability to threaten the United States and other people. Over what period of time? As fast as possible. Can't tell you what that'll be, and most people are predicted it'll take a fair amount of time. In Iraq only or in Syria Everywhere, as well? Everywhere, wherever they are. That's what the president has said, and that's what his policy is, and that's why he has asked for no geographical limitation. Uh, you know, everybody, I think, has read the Atlantic article uh, for, by Graham Wood talking about really what, what ISIS, ISIL is all about. They require territory. Does that defeat mean denial of territory? Ultimately, of course it does. So what, what, what number would be left? I, I look, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get some sort of sense here. I, I mean, I can't tell I mean, you. Were, were there a few Nazis left after World War II? Sure. Did the war end and was there unconditional surrender? Yes. Did it eliminate the threat? Yes. Did we rebuild Germany and move on with Japan? Yes. But were there some Nazis around? You bet. Will there be some members lingering around as there are of other extremist groups, most likely, but they'll suffer the same fate. The so, point so, is, so, so, so similar the point that, is as an organization, people. as an entity, as a viable uh, sort of conglomerated threat to the United States and the West and the rest of the world, it will be destroyed. Oh, pretty, pretty well decimated. Okay. Do you agree with, I think, most military experts that in order to achieve that decimation, that defeat, that destruction, is going to require ground forces? I some, believe, of some type. I believe it will require some type of forces on the ground. Now, if, if it's not, not ours, but some type. Okay, so so, so you got thirty, forty thousand members of ISIL right now. Uh, kind of the reports we're hearing is their numbers are, are growing faster than we're destroying them. Um, they're they're not being degraded. They may be degraded in some places, but growing in others, spreading in other other places. Uh, how, how many ground troops do you think it's going to take, realistically, to to decimate them, to defeat well, them? Uh, it's not up to me to uh, prognosticate on the numbers of ground troops. That's, that's something that uh, General Dempsey and okay. Sandy Winterfeld enough, and others have to it, it, would, it would be. But, but one thing I know is it's doable, and there are a number of different ways to do it. Uh, and uh, we're looking at exactly what that structure and format may be. And there are a number of ways to come at it, by the way, some of which mix kinetic with diplomatic. And, and um, you know, we have to see what happens in the course of the decisions that are made over the course of the next weeks and months as to what shape that approach takes. So, so we obviously have Arab, straight, Arab states participating in airstrikes. Have you got commitments of other Arab states other than the Iraqi security forces and the Kurdish Peshmerga? Uh, per, per, Peshmerga? Uh, do you have commitments from any of the other states in terms of ground troops to join that coalition? I have personally uh, listened to affirmations of a willingness uh, to do it under the right circumstances or under certain circumstances. I'm not going to call them commitments until they are in a context, but it clearly is uh, a potential under certain circumstances. Who, who would lead that ground effort? Well, uh, these are all the details that have to be worked out in an order of battle and a structure. Um, I understand their details, but is there, is there really a, somebody targeted in terms of one of those Arab states that actually lead that ground effort? Somebody capable of doing it? Absolutely. Okay. Let me go on to uh, Ukraine. Um, President Poroshenko did give a, a very impassioned uh, speech here in front of a joint session of Congress where, where he did say we don't need to provide the ground troops uh, they'll they'll take care of defeating the rebels but they have to, they have to have more than blankets um, I know in discussions with a number of people that one of the reluctance of providing those def defensive weaponry is that the calculation is if we provide defensive lethal weaponry Russia will just up up the ante. Is, is that one of the cons? Is that one of the things the, the uh, administration is concerned about? Well, I'm not going to speak to, uh, I'm not going to articulate the 
parameters of the debate in terms of what they're concerned or not concerned about, but an argument is certainly made by people that whatever you put in, nobody, not even Poroshenko, who I met with uh, you know, a week or so ago, uh, a couple of weeks ago, not even he believes that they can get enough material that they can win. He believes they might be able to raise the cost and do more damage. But there isn't anybody who believes that Ukraine, with its size of its military and its current structure, is going to have the ability on its own to win a war against Russia. So there's an imbalance to start with here. And, and you have to try to, you know, sort of pin that in. Now, that doesn't mean it isn't worth raising the cost. And there are plenty of people advocating that you ought to raise the cost no matter what. So those are the things that have to be balanced here. Another concern I've heard voice, and I agree with this, that the weaker Russia becomes, the more dangerous they are. Uh, is, that, is that a calculation you agree with as well? Not necessarily. It's certainly one of the theories that is put on the table. It's a, it's a calculation you have to analyze and weigh, but it doesn't necessarily have to be true, no. Uh, there are elements internally within Russia that ultimately could come to play, who knows when and how. Uh, an economy by the summer uh, that is uh, still hurting uh, could be an economy that some people predict could create internal dissension and different kinds of problems. There is chatter today about a very isolated Putin with an isolated group of people advocating this and people scared to, uh, you know, I mean, there are different parameters to this. I'm not going to sit here and, and analyze it, you know, at this moment, but except to say there are lots of different considerations. A, a quick budget-related question. Uh, I think everybody that's gone over to Ukraine, Eastern Europe, is, is uh, dismayed at really how effective Russian propaganda is. And, and really, you know, th there's really no pushback. It's, 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 uh, uh, we, we've unilaterally disarmed in terms of propagation, uh, propaganda war. Is that something within your State Department budget uh, you're looking to it is, and but try, it try is. and counter? You bet it is, but I have to tell you it is within the constraints that we're operating in, and it is no, nowhere near uh, what it ought to be. Uh, we are engaged in a major initiative. We're working with the Emiratis. There's a new center for... Uh, disseminating information that's being put together that the Emiratis are helping pay for, are paying for. And this will be a major center for use of social media to counter some of the, um, uh, some of the uh, propaganda that's being put out by ISIL itself. But Russia has resorted to a level, and you all see it, you can, you, I mean, it floods the Baltic states, it floods Poland, it floods uh, the frontline states, Bulgaria, et cetera, et cetera. There, it has a major impact, and we, we just frankly are not allocating the money to counter the way we ought to be. And we're fully prepared to go out there uh, and undertake this. Uh, Senator, you mentioned at the beginning why we use OCO. <laughs> this is one of the reasons. Uh, we rely on OCO because, frankly, the appropriations aren't on time. And so we need multi-year authority to do multi-year tasks. And we need to get the resources to be able to respond to this kind of thing. With about $7 billion in OCO, and we're putting a fair amount of that into Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, Pakistan, and uh, Syria, humanitarian assistance, counterterrorism partnership, countering Russian pressure, we have $350 million. So that's how we're bolstering Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia, to actually go after this, it's not enough. I'm just telling you bluntly, it's not enough. And they're spending hugely on this vast propaganda machine, which people believe in the places they get them because there's nothing countering it. So according to people in many of those states, we're the problem. Russia is there defending Russian-speaking people. There's no sense of Russian transgression across the border. The people in Russia don't even know how many soldiers are dying? It's completely hidden from them. And we need to be able to counter this and tell the story. So, My, my point exactly. Uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary.